I have shown something similar in previous videos, but what I'm going to do here, just to test it out, I have a power supply over here, which is current limited to around 50 amps, connected through these alligator clips and a 1 ohm resistor. That will limit the current here because I have approximately 12 volts to just over 10 amps. And when I connect this other alligator lead up to the positive terminal, I will take a look at the current to see what happens to it. And with the switch off, nothing happens. That's just fine. So let's turn the switch on and see what happens then. The switch is now on and we'll see what happens. When the previous owner did this, the caps blew up. Probably because he had the wrong polarity. But let's see what happens here. Point 0.6 amps. No issues there. Let's see if we have an output voltage now. I'm just going to take my standard multimeter, put it on AC volts, and on the outlet side I'm just going to jam the test leads in here. One in, pos one in the uh, line, one in the neutral. Make sure nothing's shorted there. And here we go. Volts AC, the power switch is on, I'm going to now connect up the battery once again through that 1 ohm resistor to limit the current and see what happens. Look at that, we have 115 volts. It does work, they just connected it backward and blew it up. That's all. Everything else is fine. Over here we have 0.3 amps of current draw. No problem there. The fuse is still good but those input caps are necessary for this to run under load. So I need to find some capacitors to replace those with. I also want to mention the output capacitor on this one, which happens to be fine, but it's 200 volts, which is not really adequate. I always like to see 250 volt components on the output side, but we'll excuse that. It is 100 microfarads, which is pretty good for 400 watt inverters. So. Kudos to Wagon Tech for having good input capacitance and good output capacitance. Now, these are 105C capacitors and 2200 microfarads, 16 volts. 16 volts is on the iffy side, but the rest of those parameters are pretty good. I don't have the right capacitor. I have this bag of 25 volt, which is what they should have used. Uh, 680 microfarad capacitors. They're a little bit smaller, but you know what? They're in a lot better shape than these are, so I'm just going to put those in and it will run the inverter just fine. A lot of lesser brands would only put this sort of capacitance in a 400 watt inverter, so it will work okay. But these are very good quality capacitors, unlike the ones I took out, and they will function at least as well, even though their value is far, far lower. So I'm going to put these in and uh, then we'll continue our testing. And there we have it, two capacitors replaced. And for any of you who think that doing something like this is as simple as swapping capacitors, then you've never done it. This took me about 10 minutes to do, and I'm not a novice around soldering iron. It's just a pain in the butt to work on stuff like this sometimes. For various reasons. But in any case, those two capacitors are in there. Obviously, make sure you put them in in the proper polarity, or they're just going to explode again. That won't help you very much. And I also want to note that the capacitance value when you're choosing a replacement capacitor is one of the least important parameters. Voltage is probably the most important. These are a better voltage factor than the other ones were and will work better in this application because of that, uh, in terms of reliability that is. In terms of performance, the most important characteristic is impedance at the frequency of interest. Now, I don't know specifically what the frequency of interest is, but I do know that these are very high quality capacitors, and the ones that I removed I'm sure are not, because this is a consumer electronics device. Not faulting them for it, but that's just the way that the market works. So even though these are 680 microfarads and the ones I replaced are 2200, these will probably work almost as well, if not as well, as the capacitors I replaced, just because they are very high quality low ESR capacitors. And I also want to mention when you replace caps like this make sure it is imperative 
make sure these are, that these are fully seated, that they are seated directly against the printed circuit board. If you have even a few millimeters of distance, distance between the capacitor and the circuit board, they won't work properly. Make sure that they are fully seated. Solder them in, and then you should be good. So, I have those capacitors in. Let's do the same test again and make sure that things still work. Alright, same setup as before. Let me get this chair out of the way quick. And I have the negative connected directly up to my power supply and the positive going through that 1 ohm resistor. The switch is in the on position and I have my clamp meter connected but not turned on, so let me turn it on quickly. And I won't put that in frame, but I'll just let you know if anything goes wacky on it. So these caps are in there in the correct polarity. Let's see what happens when I connect it up. .42 amps. And now it dropped down to .1. .2 amps. No problem there. I assume the output voltage is still good. But just to check that, I have a 40 watt light bulb connected up to this cord. So, let's plug it in. Now when I connect this up, I should have a 40 watt light bulb running. That will draw about 4 amps from my battery, which will probably be too much through a 1 ohm resistor, but let's give it a try here. And the light lights up, and then it shuts down due to under voltage. That's expected. So what I'm going to do is take my resistor out of the equation and I'm just going to connect this directly up to positive. But I'm going to do that through a fuse. This here is a 10 amp automotive circuit breaker. I'm going to connect my positive up to that, just like this. And I'm going to connect the other side of the breaker up to this alligator clip, which will then go to my inverter. And now I'm drawing around 4 amps and the light bulb is lighting up just fine. So it seems like this inverter is working. The next step is to reassemble it completely and then test it. I have the inverter reassembled just like it was. I had to use a hammer to put the back cover back on again but no harm. So, the next step is to reaffix this label. Now, why is the label important? Well, if I want to resell it, people want the label. Otherwise, how do they really know what they're getting? But also, it's kind of like medicine in your medicine cabinet. If you don't know what it is, how are you going to use it properly? So, I'm going to put the label back on. Now, how am I going to do that? Well, this part is really complicated. Glue. What's the best glue for it? Well, probably label adhesive, but I don't have that, so you know what I'm going to use? Yeah, I'm going to use what I have. Surprise, huh? So I'm just going to put some liquid nails on here and put the label on. Should work just fine. And there we go. One inverter label. Securely affixed. Let's move on. Alright, all it cost me was a couple of capacitors that I already had on hand, and this inverter is fixed, right? Well, not yet. Nothing is actually fixed until you stress test it. So, I'm going to connect up these leads. They're very cheap, but they are the ones that it came with, so I'm just going to use those positive and negative. And we'll make sure that this inverter actually works like it is supposed to. Now this power supply is approximately a 50 amp power supply. This is a 400 watt inverter. That means that I don't even need a battery. I can just use my power supply. And I'm just going to connect the clamps up to my power supply directly. Now if something goes wrong with this inverter and it shorts, the fuse in my power supply will go. But because it's a 50 amp fuse, I shouldn't have to worry about that unless this fails. 
I have no reason to believe that it will, but let's see what this inverter does. So I'm going to plug in my load bank here. I have a 400 watt light connected, and I'm going to also connect up... Actually, let me get a better instrument than a multimeter, just for interest's sake. I thought you might find this interesting. It's not necessary to test the inverter, but I'm going to use it because I have it at the moment. So this is showing the output waveform of the inverter, the voltage, and the frequency. It's right around 60 hertz, perfectly acceptable, 118 volts, just fine. That is a modified sine wave, no issue. Right now it is running a 40 watt load. If I turn that load off, this is what happens to the waveform. Not much of a surprise. Let's see what happens when I turn on a 100 watt load. Sorry for the squeak, these light sockets are kind of cheap. There's 100 watts, it's drawing 9 amps. 200 watts, it's drawing 17 amps. 300 watts, and the fan just turned on at 300 watts, as you might be able to hear. 118 volts, still good. 26 amps, 400 watts. This is a 400 watt inverter, let's remember. 120 volts. And you can see that the waveform is starting to represent a square wave, but that's pretty normal because this inverter is fully loaded. And I will turn on another 40 watts. So we are now drawing more than 40 amps out of this power supply. Let me take a look at my clamp meter quickly here. And we are drawing 43 amps from my power supply. And that's about the most that this power supply can do. This inverter is outputting more than 400 watts. It is a 400 watt inverter. So I'm just going to let this run for a while and see what the inverter does with that. We have it slightly overloaded, but it's performing admirably. And once again, like I mentioned, you don't really have anything fixed until you test it. So I'm stress testing it here. I have it fully loaded and I'm going to let it run for a while and see what happens. This wasn't meant to be a review, but one thing I want to mention on this particular inverter is that the fan doesn't blow any air. And as soon as I lift it up, the fan sounds different and now it blows plenty of air. Well, so you turn it over and the vents are on the bottom. They get plugged if you just set it right down on the surface, so I'm going to set it over here so it overhangs my table a little bit. That way I can get some air. But uh, I'll just let it continue running and stress test this thing fully and see how it works. It is still outputting more than 400 watts, more than what it's rated for, which is a good sign, at 120 volts so it hasn't sagged. And uh, overall it's performing pretty well, but that's not the topic of this video. I just want to make sure that it doesn't explode or start smoking or something like that. These cables are nice and warm, but you know what? The inverter is performing pretty well, so I'm just going to uh, let it continue operating. And after 10 minutes or so, we'll see if it survived. Well, this repaired Wagon Tech 400 watt inverter has been outputting more than 400 watts for about 10 minutes. And although it is quite warm, almost uncomfortably so, it has survived just fine. And I'm going to call it repaired. Now, this inverter does not have any thermal protection in it, so if it overheats, it will fail. So don't block the vents on it, but in any case, this is the conclusion of this video. This inverter has been fixed, and, uh, well, you can do what you want with it now. Thanks for watching.